Okay, thank you, Mark. So um, I have a, a usually detailed uh, director's report uh, prepared by uh, various members of the staff, so we do have a lot of ground to cover. I did th thought it was probably important to start off by just marking the moment uh, yesterday, obviously, with the 10th anniversary of the 9-11 tragedies. I'm sure all of you reflected on where you were when those horrible events occurred 10 years ago. I can tell you at a personal level, I was sitting in the office of my laboratory meeting with various members of my lab on that day in what seemed like a very calm morning at NIH. Um, interestingly, there's some important history associated with this council and 9-11 because just a two-minute walk from where I was sitting in my lab office was the Natural Conference Center, which is where council used to meet, and they were convened on day two of uh, their September meeting. Um, I'm told that when all this happened, Francis Collins was handed a note or somehow was told uh, uh, the information about the events, and shortly thereafter, the meeting ended abruptly. Um, I will also tell you, uh, many council members were stranded here in the area for multiple days uh, to follow. Um, so um, what, from our collective sanity, I'm just hoping nobody comes up to me and passes a note or whispers in my ear anything for the next two days. I uh, don't need that to happen. Actually, anymore. Eric, can I make a slight correction yeah, on that? What that? And that is Francis was actually out of the room. He was out of the uh -huh. room for conflict reasons. And he was the one who came back and told us about it. Well, so it was a bizarre time. So I just thought it was important to remind us of that history. So uh, the open session of council um, is being webcast live as it, uh, we are going to continue to do in the future. And we also will make web archives available of the open session and all of its documents. Um, for new council members and also for our ad hoc members or people who haven't been at council for a while and notice some things are different, I just want to make you aware there is an electronic resource that's associated with my director's report. It's sort of like a supplemental material section for a published paper and the URL that you can find all this material at is shown um, on the slide. Uh, my slides are also available electronically both as a PowerPoint file and also as a PDF file. And for slides that are associated with relevant documents or websites, we indicate that with a document number shown on the bottom right. And this entire site, including all linked documents, uh, will be permanently archived on the NHGRI website for future reference. And we do know that people access this information. You're welcome to do so. Um, I'm going to cover the usual seven areas, uh, these indicated areas, during my director's report. Uh, this has proven to be a very good framework to cover all the things I want to cover. Now, in addition to my director's report, there's going to be other presentations in the open session of council. Um, and so I've tailored my director's report around these presentations, meaning that I'll touch lightly on those topics, uh, since others will be covering them in the open session. Um, the talk after mine will be given by uh, Laura Rodriguez, uh, describing the NHGRI Office of Policy, Communication, and Education. And then uh, the next presentation will be um, on a meeting report about the Chicago Genomics meeting. A genomic medicine meeting, Terry Manolio and Jeff Ginsburg from Council will be jointly making that presentation. Um, we then have uh, three program updates that we want to give you in greater detail. Uh, two on the Common Fund, one on NHGRI uh, program. Uh, Jane Peterson will be updating you about the H3 Africa project. Jeff Struing will be updating you about the GTEx project. These are both Common Fund projects. And then as a prelude to what we're going to talk about extensively in closed session, Adam Felsenfeld is going to give an overview of NHGRI's large-scale genome sequencing program. So that's what we have in store uh, in terms of presentations during the open session. So let me just jump in and start first with uh, some general NHGRI updates. And I, I guess we should start with Nature, uh, not the journal, but uh, Nature itself. We've had more episodes of Nature's Wrath. Remember last year I updated you how we had blistering heat and power outing winds that occurred in this over the summer. And we even had a teeny, teeny little earthquake about a year ago. Uh, but this year we had the real thing just a few weeks ago. Uh, I didn't feel it. I was actually in my car pulling into the garage at Twinbrook right here. I didn't even know it had happened. Um, and, uh, but there was some minor damage uh, on and off campus. You'll see the 12A, how the A is falling out. That's on the NIH campus. That's one of the more visible bits of damage we had. But you can see also shown in the slide is what happened at the National Cathedral downtown. And also shown in the bottom right are some of the cracks in the Washington Monument that are now there because of the earthquake. Um, so after the earthquake hit, we had a few days off. And we collected our breaths. And, and then we were hit with Hurricane Irene. Um, and it was uh, rained and rained and rained. And actually, last week was even worse than the actual hurricane itself. Now, in some ways, I just think that these two natural disasters were just a test of our emergency preparedness for the next disaster that will be faced. And that's, of course, the upcoming budget showdown. 
Um, but I'll, I'll give you more about that uh, a little bit later. Uh, significant NHGRI updates. Uh, let me start here more seriously with this important um, update, um, which uh, all of you should have gotten emailed about last week or we made public last week. Uh, Mark Geyer is now the Deputy Director of NHGRI. Um, 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 it, as his, since he was hired as employee number four uh, in 1988, he's had a, a long and wonderful <laughs> career at this institute. Almost a decade now uh, serving as the director of the extramural program. Remember that he was my acting deputy director since I became director in December 2009. And, and now he'll simply flip his acting uh, titles. He will be the deputy director of the institute and the acting director of our extramural program while longer term leadership plans are formulated. Um, as mentioned during the staff introductions, uh, Dr. Derek Scholes recently joined NHGRI as the new chief of our policy and program analysis branch within our Office of Policy, Communications, and Education. Derek received his doctoral training at the University of Liverpool uh, and then went to Albany, New York for postdoctoral training at the Wadsworth Center. He's an alumnus of this NHGRI American Society of Human Genetic Public Policy Fellowship Program. You just heard and were introduced to our, our newest member, Christrina Kapusti. Um, and, uh, and as an alumnus of that program, um, well, while he was in that program, he spent some time at NHGRI and a few months within the branch that he now heads, but then went off and did a year-long stint in the late Senator Edward Kennedy's office. Uh, he comes to us most directly from the American Heart Association, where he advocated for legislation supporting health and biomedical research, including significant contributions to see GINA passed and to help implementing the regulations um, as they got drafted as well as substantial work on Family Smoking Prevention and Tobacco Control Act. Flipping over to our intramural program, earlier this summer, Dr. Paul Liu was named the NHGRI Deputy Scientific Director by Dan Kastner, our Scientific Director. Dr. Liu is a tenured senior investigator. He came to NIH and NHGRI a year before I did, actually in 1993, at the inception of our intramural program. And he's a world expert in the onset development and progression of leukemia. Dr. Liu also heads the oncogenesis and development section within our genetics and molecular biology branch. Uh, the deputy scientific position actually became available because our previous and longstanding deputy scientific director, Andy Boxavonics, um, accepted a new NIH-wide position in the NIH Office of Intramural Research, which is headed by Michael Gottesman. And in this new position, Andy will provide leadership in the area of bioinformatics and information technology for the entire uh, NIH intramural program. But in addition, he'll continue to have his affiliation with NH NHGRI, where he'll continue his research role and directing our bioinformatics core. Along with the announcement last week about Mark Geyer, uh, we also announced uh, the appointment of Jim Mulliken as director of the NIH Intramural Sequencing Center. Uh, Jim is an outstanding genomics researcher, bringing many years of high-level experience to this position, starting at the Sanger Institute and now for many years at NHGRI. I uh, took a lot of interest in this search and eventual appointment of Jim. Uh, as the person who originally founded uh, NISC in 1997 and was the director for over 12 years. Uh, when I had to hand over the acting director reins, um, I was very comfortable doing this so by having Jim take over as acting director since December 2009. Um, and, and now I'm really delighted to see him selected by Dan Kastner to be NISC's permanent director. Vivian Odawong, who's a program director in our extramural research program, was elected a fellow in the American Psychological Association. Fellow status is an honor bestowed upon members of this association who have shown evidence of unusual and outstanding contributions or performance, and it requires evidence of national impact on the field of psychology. So congratulations, Vivian. Now, there are two special advisors that are now on board at NHGRI. Um, both have been mentioned um, at previous uh, council meetings, and I just wanted to give you a little updates about both. Uh, the first is Karen Rothenberg, who is here, sitting in the front row. Uh, um, Karen is, is taking a one-year sabbatical from the University of Maryland Law School to work full-time at NHGRI. Um, she's working jointly at NHGRI and also the Department of Bioethics in the NIH Clinical Center. And during this year, she has multiple projects that she'll be pursuing, um, one of which is to lead an effort to take a rigorous and thoughtful examination of our LC program and other NHGRI components that will expand and integrate into the vision for genomics and society um, as described in our recently published strategic plan. Second thing she's going to be involved in is working with colleagues here to co-author some scholarly papers in areas such as regulation of genomic research and the return of research results and incidental findings encountered in whole genome sequencing studies. 
And third effort, we'll be exploring how theater vignettes can enhance our understanding of ELSI issues in genetics and innovation in science. So we're happy that Karen is on board. And sitting just a couple seats, a uh, little bit back and a couple seats over, from her is our, my other special advisor, uh, Mark Williams, who's also here spending about a week a month at NHGRI as a special advisor in the area of genomic medicine. Mark's director of the Intermountain Healthcare Clinical Genetics Institute in Salt Lake City. Um, among his various efforts with us, Mark is particularly active in working to help us enhance our programs related to genomics and electronic health records, as well as the development of clinical genomics information systems. And for the latter, he's actually going to be co-chairing a workshop in December that I'll be mentioning later in my talk. I would encourage you during the breaks to talk to either or both of them. They'll be around um, during the open session of council. And we're delighted to have both of them on board, and they're proving to be very helpful to me. So moving beyond NHGRI, um, many things are changing. In fact, lots of deck chairs are getting rearranged, it seems, at NIH. So let me run through the major uh, uh, announcements in that area. So Dr. Martha Summerman has now arrived as the new director of the National Institute of Dental and Craniofacial Research. She previously was the dean at the University of Washington School of Dentistry, a position that she's held since 2002 before coming to NIH. She's an internationally known research and educator, and her research has focused on defining the key regulators controlling development, maintenance, and regeneration of oral, dental, and cranial facial tissues. Uh, major changes at the National Institute of General Medical Sciences. Um, as you know, Jeremy Berg recently departed as director. Uh, Judith Greenberg is now in place as the acting director of, the Nash of this institute. Um, She's a developmental biologist and has been director of the NIGMS Division of Genetics and Developmental Biology since 1988. I should point out that this division that she heads has an annual budget of $566 million, which is bigger than NHGRI in budget. So uh, she's terrifically qualified to be an acting director. And she's actually served previously as acting director from May of 2002 until November of 2003. Um, she will not have a long stint in this acting role because um, Dr. Chris Kaiser, who is currently the chairman of the Department of Biology at MIT, has been selected to be the next director of NIGMS, pending final approvals, which are being sought. I happen to know Chris well, um, besides both of us being born in St. Louis, about a year apart, although we didn't know him back then. Um, our, our career paths have actually overlapped in various ways over the years. Uh, he's an outstanding yeast biologist and a well-regarded scientific leader at MIT. Some of his references included people we know very well in the, in the Cambridge area. I happen to know a little bit more about that because I served on the search committee, and it was uh, really just outstanding that we were able to identify someone of his caliber and convince him to come here. And uh, we're expecting, assuming all approvals come in, that he'll be starting at the helm of NIGMS um, April 1st of next year. And uh, in fact, we're already having discussions with him about ways to consider uh, enhanced interactions between our institute and NIGMS. Um, also, uh, significant changes afoot for the National Center for Research Resources, NCRR. Barbara Alving, who's currently the director, will be leaving NIH at the end of the month. She's been director of the NCRR since 2007. Previously, she served as the deputy and then acting director of the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute and also headed the Women's Health Initiative before she came to NCRR. Um, uh, incoming acting director is uh, Dr. Louise Ram, who's now the deputy director and the director of extramural activities for NCRR, and she's agreed to be the acting director for NCRR starting October 1. Now, Dr. Ram received her PhD in microbiology at the University of Virginia in 1974, as a faculty member at Johns Hopkins and the microbiology department. Um, she joined NCRR in 1987 as a health scientist administrator in the biological models and materials program, and subsequently became director of that program in 1994. Of course, the interesting thing about NCRR is that um, it is um, proposed for NCRR to go away um, around October 1 or shortly thereafter, and we'll get to this more when we talk about uh, the proposed National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences, where a major section of NCRR will move into. And so this is a, all very much transitional issues waiting for some of the reorganization, proposed reorganizational things that uh, are, are making their way through uh, the legislative approvals. But that's the current state of affairs for NCRR. It's also major changes in the Center for Scientific Review. Uh, Dr. Tony Scarpa is departing the director directorship of that center later this month, and he's held that position since 2005. During his tenure there, Dr. Scarpa implemented the trans-NIH enhancing peer review changes, which included the new scoring system. He also saw NIH through the review of 40,000 American Recovery and Reinvestment Act applications two years ago. 
Um, following Dr. Scarpa's departure, and while NIH conducts a national search for a new director, Dr. Richard Nakamura will serve as acting director of CSR. Dr. Nakamura has served in leadership positions at the National Institute of Mental Health, uh, multiple different uh, leadership positions. He has been the scientific director most recently. Prior to that, he was the deputy director. He was also acting director of the institute from 2001 to 2002. At the NIH Center for Information Technology in October, uh, Andrea Norris uh, will become this center's new director. Um, she will also be the acting chief information officer of NIH. Uh, Ms. Norris comes to, from the National Science Foundation, having been there for 10 years and most recently as the acting chief information officer and director of the organization responsible for providing agency-wide information technology systems, services, and supporting infrastructure. Going over to the National Cancer Institute, Dr. Barbara Wold has begun her stint as interim director for NCI Center for Cancer Genomics while she takes a sabbatical from her uh, appointment at Caltech. Dr. Wald, who's familiar to many of us, um, are, is the Bren Professor of Molecular Biology and Director of the Beckman Institute at Caltech. She's obviously served on numerous advisory roles for NHGRI, is also one of our grantees. The sad news that occurred over the summer, um, a couple of things to report. Uh, Dr. Bernadine Healy, former director of the NIH, passed away in August. Uh, during her tenure and as the first female NIH director, Dr. Healy started the Women's Health Initiative. She also recruited Frances Collins to come lead the NHGRI, and she was the one that helped create the NHGRI Intramural Research Program. Uh, she also ran the Red Cross in the late 1990s. Another, uh, another uh, sad announcement that Senator Mark Hatfield, who was a visionary supporter of medical research, passed away in August, in fact, the same week. As chair of the Senate Committee on Appropriations, he served as a strong and principled advocate for the needs of those who are less fortunate. He also consistently defended the importance of NIH-funded research and its importance in our society. And I should point out, and I think very appropriately, you should realize that the NIH Clinical Center um, is actually bears his name. It's the Mark Hatfield Clinical Research Center um, and uh, commemorating his contributions to NIH. Um, as part of ongoing effort to examine and improve the diversity of the scientific workforce, NIH has actually commissioned uh, several different studies to look at this uh, problem. Um, one such study uh, was led by former NIH Deputy Director Rainer Kington, and that was recently published in Science. Uh, this study, and just in brief, analyzed the probability of securing first-time NIH R01 funding, uh, looking at the period 2000 to 2006. And they looked at the probability based on race and ethnicity, controlling for observable characteristics such as NIH training, research experience, and institution. But even after for controlling for all those factors that might influence the likelihood of success, black applicants were found to be 10 percent less likely than white applicants to receive Type 1 R01 award. Very concerning. Um, and in the same issue of science, Drs. Tabak and Collins uh, provided a perspective piece that outlines NIH commitment to a diverse biomedical workforce and future plans to address this issue. The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services has now issued a final rule that amends the Public Health Service regulations on, quote, responsibility of applicants for promoting objectivity and research for which PHS funding is sought and responsible prospective contractors. This is a word, a big mouthful basically talking about financial conflict of interest, especially for those in the extramural program. It's actually a revision of the 1995 guidelines and reflects a tightening of the rules. And there are major changes to previous policy that if you're not aware of, I would encourage you to become aware of. Um, it includes lowering the monetary threshold at which significant financial interests require disclosure, generally from about 10,000 to 5,000. Requires investigators to disclose to their institutions all of their significant financial interests related to their institutional responsibilities. Requires institutions to report to NIH additional information on identified financial conflicts of interest and how they are being managed. Requires institutions to make certain information accessible to the public concerning identified significant financial interests held by senior and key personnel. And it requires investigators to complete training related to the regulations and their institution's financial conflict of interest policy. Of course, the reason you want to become familiar with this is that the implementation of this new policy will occur no later than August 24th of next year. And I'm sure you're hearing about this at your local institutions. I think this is being taken very seriously, as it should. 
Moving on, a key flagship component of Francis Collins' plans for NIH as director is to establish this proposed National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences, or NCATS, I alluded to earlier, um, related to the, the closing of NCRR and the movement of programs within NCR to new homes. Well, there's been considerable effort within NIH to formulate the plans for creating this new center and considerable reactions, both positive and negative, in the scientific community about the creation of this center. Uh, there is now a formulated mission statement for this proposed center to advance the discipline of translational science and catalyze the development of testing of novel diagnostics and therapeutics across a wide range of human diseases and conditions. Now, as you may be hearing about or you may have read about, um, this is complicated, especially in the current political climate. Um, where this was supposed to be created at the beginning of next fiscal year. Um, but we likely won't have a budget at the beginning of the next fiscal year, and yet there is a whole choreography that must take place in order for all of this to happen. Um, just briefly, let me just tell you so you know what's like, what, what is thought to happen. The most likely scenario at the moment for creating NCATS next fiscal year, and hopefully early in the fiscal year, We'll, in the face of a continuing resolution, which is basically continue business as it was last year at the funding levels of last year, because that's likely what we'll have, will be what is a, called an anomaly, which is basically wording that is put into the continuing resolution that says it's everything as before with the following anomalies, and then they can list things that are different. And the hope is that wording to create NCATs will be put as an anomaly, until, and this is requiring, I'm sure, hundreds of hours of leadership time uh, uh, Francis and others to make this happen. Um, and so it is hopeful that will happen. And so in anticipation that NCATS is going to be created in the coming months, maybe weeks, but hopefully months, in fact, a search committee for its director has now begun its work. I know about this because I'm actually co-chair of the search committee along with Tom Insull, the director of NIMH. And uh, so first thing I would say is if you know of good candidates, possibly be interested in running this flagship new component of the NIH, hopefully, once it gets created. Um, please let me know. Uh, the search committee is active, and we uh, and Francis is extremely anxious for us to identify somebody so that when it does get created, shortly thereafter, we would have a director in place. There are also implications of the creation of NCATS for NHGRI. As a reminder, the National Center for Translational Therapeutics, uh, which houses within it the NIH Center for Chemical Genomics, all entities uh, you've heard a little bit about in the past Chris Austin is now the scientific director of that entire enterprise. It's grown up within NHGRI for about the pa past nine or ten years. Um, but it will depart in block completely uh, to NCATS when NCATS gets created, taking with it about over 100 employees of NHGRI will be moving into NCATS as part of, uh, of that transfer. Now, if you want to know more about NCATS uh, and the proposed uh, new center, uh, the blueprint for it was written up uh, by Francis and published um, in Science Translational Medicine, and that's available uh, in Document 11. I would encourage you to look at that if you're not familiar with some of the details of what Francis sees for this new center. Okay, now to the really tricky part of director's report. Fiscal year 2012 appropriations. It's so complicated, I had to go to a smaller font to fit it in because I have so much to tell you. So, and I figured you're probably very interested in this. So we're currently in fiscal year 2011, operating with a budget that was signed by the President in April amid imminent threats of a government shutdown. The budget reflects a 1% reduction compared to last year, a reminder that's the first such reduction that NIH had seen in many, many years. It provided NIH with $30.9 billion and NHGRI with $511 million. Now, since fiscal year 12 begins October 1, you might have naive, naively expected that Congress would have completed its passage of legislation to fund the government for next year. But as you well know, congressional agreement on funding the government is rarely straightforward. And the debate, the debate this year is particularly complex because of the recent, shall we say, situation with the debt deal. I'll have more to say about the debt deal on the next slide. But here's where we're at. The President's fiscal 12 budget requests $32 billion for NIH and $535 million for NHGRI, a 2.4 and 1.7 percent increase over the current fiscal year, respectively. Now, at this point in time, such an increase seems extremely unlikely, considering the larger set of complex circumstances. So Congress needs to pass a number of bills to fund the government. To give you a flavor, so far the House has passed six of 12 such bills, three are out of committee. 
including the one we care about, um, and uh, the others, uh, and three are without, oh no, three are out of committee, and three, including the one that we're most interested in, are without action. The Senate is doing worse. Uh, they've only passed one of 12 bills, three are out of committee, and eight are without action. And the one we're most interested in, which sets the funding levels for NIH, is the one crafted by the Labor, HHS, and Education, and Related Agencies Appropriation Subcommittee in the House and Senate, collect, co sort of known as the Labor HHS Bill. Neither House nor Senate has passed the Labor HHS Bill this year, or even debated draft legislation. So at this point in time, we don't even know what the funding levels for NIH or NHGRI uh, will be. Now, it's unlikely that Congress will pass appropriations bills by the end of this month, so you're most surely looking towards a continuing resolution to keep the government functioning in the interim until a final agreement is reached for the rest of the year. The most likely scenario at this point is a continued resolution for authorizing operations through the holidays to allow the debt deal processes to work their way through the system. Well, predictions about NIH funding um, are quite buried depending upon who you ask and when you ask. Um, it would seem the best case would be flat. The most realistic case is something like minus 2%, and the worst case being something like minus 5%. Um, what I would tell you is in the meantime, please keep your seatbelts buckled because this is going to be a wild and turbulent ride for the next few months. And, and the real elephant um, in the room in terms of appropriations, of course, uh, and the reason why Congress has not yet completed its appropriations work is the strong disagreement among uh, congressional members regarding the role and size of the government programs. Um, this most recently manifested as the debate over the size of the government debt that, had it not been temporarily resolved, would have led to the government um, defaulting on its debt for the first time in history. And as you know, a debt deal was struck at the 11th hour and the default was avoided in a dramatic fashion. But the not so good news for all this is that the terms of the deal are almost certainly to affect NIH funding in a bad way uh, for several years to come. So the so-called debt deal comes in two parts. One part is a cap on the total funds that Congress can appropriate for, for each year going forward through the next decade. This part of the deal only sets a cap on total spending across the government. And so there's no reason to assume that all agencies will be um, equally impacted. And it's really difficult to predict how NIH may fare compared with other agencies, but it's clear that all budgets will be under extreme pressure. Part two of the debt deal established a joint select committee on deficit reduction, more commonly referred to as the super committee, to identify additional ways to reduce the federal deficit. So by November 23rd, this group is charged with crafting a bill that reduced the deficit by at least $1.2 trillion by 2021, and to ideally identify up to $1.5 billion um, uh, in, uh, one trillion in total reductions. Each chamber of Congress must then is required through a simple up and down vote to approve the super committee proposal by December 23rd. The committee's proposal may include reductions in spending, such as further reductions to agency funding or entitlement programs, as well as ways to increase revenues through changes in the tax code, for example. Well, a very important detail is what happens if the super committee fails to come upon a proposal that they all agree to, and if Congress does not pass the proposal by the end of the year. A failure at either would trigger the across-the-board cuts to federal agencies in 2013 to equal the $1.2 trillion they were supposed to have identified. And this substantial degree of cuts will likely have a significant effect on the NIH if it's a simple trigger. Well, what does all this mean, again, for us? Well, while the debt ceiling agreement is not expected to substantially diminish 2012 funding, and like I said, most likely scenarios flat or minus 2%, it, is, it well may result in significant cuts in 2013 and beyond. In fact, we're being asked to prepare various scenarios for 2013 that include cuts of 5% and also cuts of 10%. Um, I, it was interesting, this morning when I was driving here and I had on the radio, I, it was the first time I had heard an advertisement uh, sponsored by AAMC, the American Association of Medical Colleges, which was, I've never heard an ad on the radio from them, and it talked about, their, their angle was um, training uh, medical professionals and talking about, you know, having not enough people to house emergency room, take care of emergency room, and so forth. And it was a very dramatic um, uh, radio ad, as you might imagine, but their message was, we simply have, through all the cutting that has to be done, the government will have to do over the next few years, we have to preserve training of health professionals and medical research, so they kept linking those two. So again, I think advocacy groups are starting to launch their campaigns, and thank goodness they are. 
Um, but it was just interesting. I'll be curious if other people hear that ad or we see similar ads from similar groups. Well, you could imagine that such, um, oh, and, uh, I already said that. You could imagine that such budgetary scenarios cause grave concerns for NIH employees, uh, both because of our own job situations, but also because the programs that we work so hard to support are all going to be threatened. Well, Senator Ben Cardin, shown here, who's the junior senator of Maryland, held a town hall with NIH employees on August 31st. It was actually preceded by a private meeting he had with the group of institute and center directors. I can tell you that in both venues, he talked passionately about the state of the economy, the complex situation with the current federal budget, and his concerns that this might have on federal workers and on NIH. Now, he's a very strong NIH supporter, as you might imagine, with NIH being based in his state, and he promised a good fight to preserve, and he would actually like to see improve our budget. But he also admitted to being involved in the strangest political situation he has faced in his long and distinguished career. In the end, he expressed a cautiously optimistic message, but he also stressed the need to be realistic about the likely difficult times we'll face over the next two to five years. Okay, that's the NIH. So let's uh, now move into our field. So, genomics updates. Uh, Ron Davis won the Gruber Genetics Prize, which is awarded for the pioneering work in biotechnologies that advance the, f for his work in, in advancing the fields of molecular genetics and genomics. Uh, Ron has been director of the Stanford Genome Technology Center since 1994 and will receive $500,000 for this for developing DNA mapping methods for studies of ways to sequence genomic variants in humans and other animals and for his contribution to developing the first microarray technologies, not to mention his work that his lab has done in sequencing yeast chromosomes, sequencing part of the E. coli genome and several other genomes. David Hausler, a professor of biomolecular engineering at the University of California, Santa Cruz, has been awarded the 2011 Weldon Memorial Prize by the University of Oxford. The prize is awarded for contributions to the development of mathematical and statistical models to be applied to problems in biology. Uh, David is director of the California Institute of Quantitative Biosciences, and he and his team's work has focused on using bioinformatics to understand the human genome, for example, by analyzing data from the Cancer Genome Atlas by developing the Cancer Genomics Browser and by founding the Genome 10K Project. Yemi Adesokin has been recognized by MIT's Technology Review Magazine by being among their 35 innovators under 35 honorees for 2011. He was honored for his work in the application of next generation sequencing to clinical diagnostics. Specifically, he founded a company called Pathogenetica, which aims to develop sequencing technologies to diagnose infectious disease. He was an alumnus of the Diversity Action Plan supported Smart Summer Undergraduate Research Program at the Baylor College of Medicine Genome Sequencing Center. Now, the TR35 list, as it is called, recognizes the world's top innovators under the age of 35 and includes those in a range of fields spanning from energy, medicine, computing, communications, nanotechnology, and other emerging areas. Uh, I thought I would just briefly tell you that in August of this year, I traveled to India on, I guess, what could be called a, a goodwill tour in genomics of sorts on behalf of NHGRI. Um, the initial, and I thought I would just tell you a few things about this. The initial purpose of my trip was to be a keynote speaker at a Founders Day celebration commemorating the first anniversary of establishing the National Institute of Biomedical Genomics um, in India. This is a, a new institute just outside of Kolkata. Um, I actually had some history with this institute being involved in some advisory input that they received about its potential creation back in 2008, then opened its doors in 2010. Um, this institute does represent a fairly significant development for genomics research in India, which is why I decided to go when invited to participate in their Founders Day. But as long as I was there, um, I used the opportunity to tour several other genomics research facilities in India selecting the specific places based on some really good input that Aravinda Chakravarti provided about uh, places that were rapidly accumulating genomics expertise. So I actually, it was, it was a rapid fire trip. It was one of these things where I visited four research facilities in three uh, cities over five days. I specifically went to two places in Bangalore, one in Calcutta and one in Delhi. And uh, in, in that short time, I can tell you, I met with a lot of investigators and many, many trainees and also some government officials. I could probably spend a long time describing my various findings and some of the things I'm still uh, have questions about, but and I'm happy to talk about that at the break. But to be brief, I just would just share with you some of my most notable observations were as follows. First of all, it's impressive how India is making significant investment in research infrastructure, especially in genomics, big buildings, um, lots of new laboratories quickly being put together. 
Second thing is it's very clear that Indian researchers are absolutely getting access to cutting edge genomic technologies. Every place I went, they were unboxing a next gen sequencing instrument or two or three, each of the places absolutely had access to that technology. I'd also tell you the research funding situation is, is, is quickly improving. Um, it doesn't seem to be the rate limiting step in many ways. Uh, they really, not like what you see here, they're not complaining about funding. They said they have the opportunities. Um, interestingly though, my fourth observation, they're actually suffering from the same computational and bioinformatics bottleneck that we have in the U.S., despite the fact that many of their students are training in computer science. But the great, great, great majority of those who train in computer science go into the private sector because their salaries are tenfold higher than what could be paid in the research settings in genomics. So I went there thinking I was going to encounter just, just tons of really good bioinformaticians, and it seemed like they were in a similar state that we were at for different reasons. So I thought it was just very interesting. In any case, I just wanted to share that with you. Okay, so for a little bit of lighter moment in the middle of my director's report, I want to tell you about a new feature I'm going to add to director's report. Um, I'm going to call genomics in the news. These are supposed to be real, they are real examples, but hopefully a little bit of fun. Um, I just want to highlight uh, some recent genomic um, uh, news features um, and uh, that I thought uh, really caught my attention. Um, and uh, to start off this new feature, I would point out we had sequencing analysis of the potato genome as recently featured on this awesomely wonderful cover of Nature. I thought the potato-based food objects to create a double helix was a work of genius, uh, and I just thought oh, all of you recognize that. Rarely have I seen uh, French fries used in such an important way. Uh, more seriously, potato is the world's third most important crop, and analysis of the genome sequence data revealed that the potato genome contains at least 39,000 protein coding genes, far more than the human genome, which I think in part explains the brilliance of Mr. and Mrs. Potato Heads. I, I personally found this to be a spectacular genomic advance. All right, I had to think of it. Sorry. I had to do it. Preparing this report is really tedious, so I got to throw in a few just, just to make me laugh while I'm preparing it. So. Okay, notably interesting creatures that have had their genome sequenced lately include the Tasmanian devil, the branching coral Acropora digifera, I think is how you pronounce it, and the Tamar wallaby. Now, why did I group these three together? There's actually great science behind each of these genomic studies, but I put these three scientific stories in the news because they're simply fun, being serious forays into the sequencing of creatures that have heavily been featured in cartoons over the years. <laughs> Another major genomic story relates to the significant news coverage about the sequencing of the marijuana genome. Specifically, a new company called Medicinal Genomics announced in August that it had generated a draft genome sequence of the marijuana plant, a cannabis sativa. Uh, company scientists became convinced to pursue this research after seeing papers published in academic journals about the plant's tumor shrinking effects in rats, and so they started a company around uh, the discoveries with that genomic data. I've heard that if this company goes public, they might offer reefer options instead of stock options, but that might just be a rumor. Just testing you, seeing if you're paying attention. Okay. And now my favorite genomics news story from the past four months. CNN reported that a New Hampshire apartment complex is mandating that residents submit their dog's DNA by a simple mouth swab if they want to have their dog in their apartment. They are then analyzing the DNA in any dog waste found on the premises and then using the proprietary, quote, poo prints program, I kid you not, the poo prints program to match DNA in the unclaimed dog waste to the DNA provided for each dog in the complex. Successful matches would indicate the guilty residents. You laugh, but the program is currently assisting similar complexes in multiple states as well as increasing interest from as far away as Canada and Germany. I just, I, you know, we're very proud of our advancing genomic technologies program because with it, we not only will save lives, we will also keep the envir environment clean. But I would also note how I am staying away from any ELSI jokes about this, although I could think of a few good ones, especially related to incidental findings and also surprising paternity evidence, but I'm just going to leave those to your imagination for now. Um, my last genomics in the news item is timed perfectly. Uh, to the individual who just walked in the door. And it, it relates to the fact that baseball players are not the only ones getting high-priced salaries due to free agency. And the growing interest in genomics has caused excited, exciting growth in the pursuit of superstar free agent genomicists. And it turns out that the biggest free agency signing since the last council meeting was Councilmember Dave Valley, 
who was lured to the Broad Institute for a lucrative contract and a really big office right next to Eric Lander's office. So actually, I'm just kidding. This is just a little bit of my humor. This was actually the name placard that was put out for David at this genomic medicine meeting in Chicago. And he arrived and saw it, and he wanted to know if we were sending him a hint or something. Or maybe Hopkins was sending him a hint or something. So that was a real, a real story. OK, so that was my genomics in the news. We will move on to more serious stuff now and talk about um, developments in the extramural program. Well, the most active issues associated with our extramural program relate to the renewal of our large-scale genome sequencing program. Um, the program represents just a little over a third of our entire budget for our extramural program. And as many of you know, in renewing the program, we issued four RFAs in the indicated areas shown on the slide. So Adam Felsenfeld is actually going to be giving a presentation about the history of our large-scale genome sequencing program and provide additional details about these RFAs and then discussion about the review of these applications that resp then in response to the RFAs will be discussed during the closed session of council uh, later today. In terms of recent accomplishments by our large-scale genome sequencing program, one highlight was in the area of comparative genomics. Using the draft genome sequence, researchers at Baylor College of Medicine published a genome-wide SNP resource for Indian origin rhesus monkeys, one of the most widely studied non-human primate model in biomedical research, and identified many potentially harmful non-synonymous coding SNPs. Another comparative uh, genomics highlight was uh, performed by Broad's Institute, recent sequencing and, anal and analyzing the genome of the North American green anole, a little lizard, um, looks a lot like the gecko lizard, I thought. Uh, their study found that the whole genome of this lizard contains about 17,500 protein coding genes, 4,000 of which are also found in human, which explains why the gecko lizard talks during commercials, <laughs> that around 30 percent of the genome is comprised of mobile elements and that the genome contains 12 mi microchromosomes. They also identified the lizard's sex chromosomes, which appear to be XX and XY, with the X chromosome being one of the lizard's microchromosomes, which was sort of interesting. In the area of medical sequencing, our large-scale genome sequencing program continues to be quite active. And in fact, there's some large and impressive studies reaching mature stages in terms of analysis. Specifically, these include um, studies of diabetes and metabolic syndrome, autism, uh, lipid levels, and tumor sequencing projects outside of TCGA. Um, and so you can see a lot of analysis. A lot of these projects are really reaching mature, mature stages. The Cancer Genome Atlas program continues to make great strides towards its ambitious goals. Remember that with the economic stimulus investment two years ago, TCGA was named an NIH signature project and, it's an, and announced its intent to initiate 20 new tumor sequencing projects following the pilot effort on glioblastoma and ovarian cancer, and also to accrue the characterized specimens from 3,000 cancer cases by September of this year. The list on the right shows the active 22 projects in TCGA right now. Accrual has actually closed for glioblastoma, ovarian, colorectal, and renal cell, uh, renal clear cell carcinoma, meaning the goal of 500 cases qualified for these projects has been achieved. Uh, this graph shows in blue the cumulative shipment of samples, not including the pilot projects, from January of 2010 to August 15th of this year. Um, as of that date, over 3,700 cases have been shipped to centers. And the red line shows the generation availability of genome sequence files as a measure of data out of the project. And even with the challenges of data management, TCGA will achieve the goal for the September deadline I told you about earlier. And representing the type of reports expected from TCGA, um, the research network published the findings from their ovarian carcinoma project earlier this year. The study included an analyses of copy number, gene expression, promoter methylation on 489 high-grade carcinomas plus exome sequence data of 316 of the specimens. The study represents the most extensive and comprehensive cancer genome study to date, and is the fifth most cited, most highly ranked article in molecular biology as assessed by the scientists. But the good news is on top of that, there's several upcoming manuscripts to watch for, um, including those reporting the results of colorectal carcinoma, acute myeloid leukemia, and breast carcinoma. One notable highlight, an additional highlight for TCGA and also for NHGRI, uh, came in the June 13th issue of Time magazine. You can see that on the cover. And within uh, Time, that issue of Time was an article on cracking cancer's code. Um, and it was a, a very uh, well done article. But the, the call out quote that they used in the article was by none other than Brand Ozenberger at NHGRI, who directs our Cancer Genome Atlas a component of the program. 
where he says, we expect 10 years from now, each cancer patient is going to want to get a genomic analysis of their cancer. So that's great when NHGRI staff is recognized in places like Time Magazine. Congratulations, Brad. The Thousand Genomes Project continues to make great progress towards its goals. Uh, phase one sequence data and associated numbers include low coverage sequencing on almost 1,100 samples, whole exome sequencing on over 1,100 samples. Um, to date, uh, 39 million SNPs, 100,000 indels, 84,000 structural variants uh, cataloged, um, and an integrated data set is going to be released uh, next month. Um, beyond that, of course, is phase two sequence data um, being generated um, this fall, uh, both low coverage and exome sequencing data being generated for over 1,700 samples. Uh, the next 1,000 Genomes Project meeting will be held um, October 10th and 11th before the International Congress of Human Genetics in Montreal. In addition, there's a 1,000 Genomes data tutorial will be held during the International Congress. Um, this sold out at last year's American Society of Human Genetics meeting with 500 participants and uh, advertisement about this session has received almost 4,000 hits on, on the website so far. So we expect uh, probably a standing room only at that upcoming uh, workshop. Before leaving um, discussion about our large-scale genome sequencing program, I thought I would mention something to you that has reached a fairly serious set of strategic discussions, including uh, discussed extensively last week at an all-day retreat of the institute directors. Bottom line, there are some early discussions about the desire to develop a trans-NIH inventory of ongoing genome sequencing projects. Initially, uh, Francis Collins was interested in pursuing this for target validation to aid therapeutic development efforts. But as more and more discussion around this topic has taken place, there's a growing list of desirable aspects of compiling such information and developing such data sets and the associated cohorts. So Francis um, asked Terry Manolio to assemble a trans-NIH committee and do an initial analysis of ongoing and planned genome sequencing projects, um, which she did in about a five-week period uh, to be and was presented last week. Um, and it really did reveal some interesting and very encouraging facts and figures. Um, for example, that across NIH, there's something like 75, th there's studies funded and planned over the next few years to generate whole genome or mostly whole exome sequencing for about 75,000 individuals, which if, and, and uh, with um, phenotype data available on some and varying levels of, of uh, sample availability and, 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 um, and um, uh, other uh, information that would become very relevant for the kinds of inventory and their possible uses. So um, there's really a significant momentum gathering about such an effort. Um, there's going to be upcoming workshops. There's also a, a private sector interest potentially in funding what would be required to pull all this together. Um, pharma has sort of indicated a desire to maybe share the cost associated with this. And obviously a growing list of possible projects one might be able to pursue if you had such data sets available in one place. So last week at uh, this uh, retreat of institute directors, uh, not surprisingly, NHGRI was now asked to be the lead institute on such an effort. Um, and, and so I would fully expect uh, that you will be hearing more about this at future council meetings um, as, as things develop. So I just wanted to put that out there. If Terry will be here later at council meeting, you can certainly ask her questions, being very involved in this over the last month. Um, Adam Felsenfeld uh, served as the NHGRI representative. He also knows quite a bit about this. But I am reasonably convinced that something like this is going to happen, and I'm sure we will be bringing this to council for additional information and updates. Yes. Eric, is that draft inventory publicly available? Well, it, it does, um, which things are where? Yeah. I, I don't think yet, but I don't think you'd want to be burnt. I mean, it, this was done rapid fire enough to sort of say it's worth now doing this in a much more rigorous way. Um, the information, I mean, you could ask Terry when she gets here about what information is shareable, but I'm not sure you'd, you'd trip up over a lot of this, I suspect, at first. Interesting. Maybe interesting. Yep. So I, I just, a little clarification, yeah. is the effort to to get a better inventory, or is the NHGR effort to actually get the data yep. all together in a way that it can be distributed His first and used? effort was to figure out what's out there, and is it worth investing to try to bring it in under one data warehouse. Based on the preliminary inventory, um, it, it seems that there's a lot out there, and it's probably worth bringing it in. Up. You probably need some pilot studies to see how well that works. Um, and um, but, but again, this is being spearheaded by private sector interests to potentially fund the gathering of this, because it would be expensive to bring it in under one roof. So stay tuned. So 
So for NHGRI's program that aims to reduce the cost and increase the rate and quality of DNA sequencing, uh, nine awards were made for applications that were discussed this, at this past May's council meeting. Um, the commitment over the life of these grants is just a little over $14 million. And these projects will ex explore a diverse a set of applications, including those listed here. And you can just read the different areas, and we discussed them um, at the last council meeting. Um, so these are some very exciting technologies that we are very uh, much looking forward to seeing how they develop uh, with the, uh, these new grants. But meanwhile, new applications for DNA sequencing technology development are due uh, later uh, next in the middle part of next month. Um, so we hope to have a continued infusion of good ideas for this program. Relevant to technology development, um, the NIH has reissued a program announcement for small business SBIR grant mechanisms, specifically R43 and R44, in the area of developing tools for biomedical and behavioral research. Uh, this is an NIH-wide program through which NHGRI could fund relevant applications. The program announcement encourages the translation of technologies for biomedical or behavioral research from academic and other small, uh, non-small business research sectors to the marketplace. It's important for NHGRI, particularly for the translation of genomic technologies, especially genome sequencing technologies, and applications are due in early November. Moving on to ENCODE and MOD and, and MOD ENCODE, NHGRI is in the early planning stages for a MOD ENCODE symposium that will be held on the NIH campus on June 20th and 21st of 2012. The goals of the symposium are to broaden community understanding of model organisms and to showcase the contributions of the MOD ENCODE consortium. Uh, we've now worked it out so the meeting will tie into the upcoming Model Organisms to Human Biology Genetic Society of America meeting, which is um, also scheduled for June 2012 in the Washington, D.C. area. These meetings essentially will be back to back. In addition to that, there's integrated analysis papers actively being developed. Um, both uh, in the ENCODE and MOD ENCODE consortium are currently in the writing phases for integrated analysis papers. ENCODE's going to coordinate their publications to feature a main integrative paper, multiple high-profile companion papers, and then many companion papers. And MOD ENCODE is working to integrate worm and fly data and, if possible, bring in the human ENCODE data. Uh, the ENCODE technology development FOA was released after May Council, and the applications were received in early August. Applications will receive uh, peer review in the fall and then council review uh, during the February meeting. For our Centers of Excellence in Genomic Science program, uh, one new award was made this year. Um, uh, Aviv Raghav and her colleagues at Broad Institute, Mass General Hospital, and Harvard will establish a Center for Cell Circuits and will develop reagents, technologies, algorithms, protocols, and strategies for reconstructing molecular circuits. We'll test these innovations by applying them to um, two circuits in mammalian cells, one transcriptional response to pathogens in dendritic cells as an example of acute response to environment, and two control of chromatin organization and gene expression in mouse embryonic stem cells as an example of circle circuits that underlie stable cell states. And dissemination of tools is an explicit goal of this center. With the addition of this new SEGS, we currently have eight active awards in the program and two centers that are phasing out of the program after their 10 years of support. Updates on our mouse knockout projects, COMP and COMP2, include the following. COMP, the knockout mouse project, winds down at the end of September. As of August 1, 8,700 knockouts had been produced, and the goal was 8,500. Recall that COMP2 is an effort to phenotype knockout strains produced by COMP. For COMP2, awards we made this fiscal year, Overall funding for the program is $111 million over five years, and the goal is to produce and phenotype 2,500 strains. I'll also tell you that there will be a major meeting this month that will reflect the finale of COMP and the kickoff of COMP2 and the launching of the International Mouse Phenotyping Consortium, otherwise known as IMPC. For our LC research program, um, there are three new program announcements that were released in July. The R01 component is designed for medium to large multidisciplinary studies. The R03 component is targeted to small, self-contained analytical or conceptual projects that can be done in two years for up to $50,000 per year. And the R21 component is aimed at cutting-edge exploratory development grants that are taking on new or rapidly evolving ethical issues or the, implementation or the implications of emerging or anticipated scientific and technical uh, developments. 
The R21 component can be requested up to two years and a total of $275,000 in direct costs. The announcements focus on the issues raised in the new strategic plans, genomic and society section, um, such as those that are listed on the slide. I would point out that a number of other NIH institutes are participating in this program announcement, including NCI, NIA, NICHD, NIDCD, NIEHS, and NINDS. And I hope all of you know what all those abbreviations stand for. If not, I could tell you. Okay. In July, NHGRI held a meeting to discuss data sharing as it relates to research ethics and policy. The meeting was organized by the Emerge Consent and Community Consultation Workgroup, and its goal was to explore how LC research, in partnership with genomic research studies like Emerge, can inform the development and implementation of research policy. The meeting focused on the impact of data sharing policies on researchers, research participants, and community partners. And the meeting extensively explored how data on these issues can be used to inform the development of research policy. In addition to researchers, bioinformatics, and policy experts and community advisors, meeting participants included NIH, OHRP, CDC, Veterans Administration, FDA, and the Institute of Medicine program officials, group health, pharmaceutical and biobank representatives, and members of professional societies and patient advocacy groups. And a journal article summarizing the workshop uh, discussion um, is, is being planned. Um, speaking of meetings, let me just let you know about some upcoming extramural meetings that are worth you knowing about. In early October, there will be a meeting of our Sears program. Then at this year's International Congress for Human Genetics meeting in Montreal will be a session organized by our ELSI program entitled Emerging Ethical Issues and Large-Scale International Genomics Research Collaborations. Later in October will be our annual meeting of our SEGS and uh, Diversity Action Plan programs to be held in Boston. And finally, in December, a workshop addressing approaches characterizing genetic variants for clinical use will be held in the D.C. area. The goal of this workshop is to identify the resources and pipelines needed to decide on the clinical relevance of genetic variants and how best to disseminate this information to support clinical use. And I mentioned this earlier because Mark Williams, um, will, along with Rex Chisholm from Council, um, are co-chairing the planning committee for this workshop. So that was um, activities of our extramural program. Now moving on to the common fund programs that um, NHGRI is responsible for, or in part responsible for. Let me get, tell you that in June 1 of this year, um, the NIH Common Funds Molecular Libraries Program began the fourth year of its production phase. The pilot phase plus the production phase to date total six years. So it's actually beginning the seventh year of the program overall. Uh, meanwhile, it met its annual quantitative goals in year three, those goals are 20 or more new projects per center, 15 or more active chemistry projects per center, and 10 to 12 approved projects by peer review per center per year. Overall, the Molecular Libraries Network has accomplished an impressive set of achievements. They've accepted 490 high throughput assays, they've completed over 180 chemistry projects, and they've produced 229 small molecule probes. While there is a future focus on quantitative milestones, these are obviously um, more difficult to set. Nonetheless, these include um, aiming to generate higher quality probes and better characterized probes. A network of centers working together um, are now working to identify appropriate benchmarks for uh, these qualitative uh, milestones. In terms of areas being served by the molecular library's effort, shown here is a distribution of health areas for which projects have been or are being pursued. And I think as you quickly scan across that pie chart, you'll see the diverse and balanced portfolio of projects assigned in the Molecular Libraries program. It also shows um, a good distribution of biological targets that would be of interest to most NIH institutes and centers. Here's a very nice highlight of the Molecular Libraries program. Um, a lead compound uh, was discovered um, in the Molecular Library Small Molecule Repository by the Scripps Screening Center in the first year of the Molecular Libraries program. This was approved as probe ML007 in February of 2007. In only five years, Scripps was able to complete lead optimization and preclinical testing of analogs of ML007 and submit an IND in January 2011 for the treatment of multiple sclerosis. The compound remains in phase one testing, but the results have not yet been disclosed. 
Of note, this is the first probe from the Molecular Libraries program to have an IND filing. And another recent highlight from the MLP, Molecular Libraries program, uh, was a little closer to home, was accomplished by the NCTT, National uh, NIH Center for Translational Therapeutics, um, which sits within NHGRI, as I told you earlier, led by Chris Austin, and was featured on the August 5th issue cover of Science. And the project reflects a major collaboration with investigators here at NHGRI, at NIAID, and also at Columbia University. Uh, they used a combination of quantitative high throughput screening and genome-wide association analyses to identify 32 highly active antimalarial compounds and genetic loci associated with differential responses to those drugs. These findings give both new leads for antimalarial treatments and insights into mechanisms of resistance to current drugs. Uh, the reason this paper is particularly notable is it sort of is a tour de force of chemical genomics. That is, it's a combination of chemistry and genomics to discover fundamentally new insights about biology and disease. Moving on to the Human Microbiome Project, um, once again, significant progress can be reported to date. There's 108 publications in PubMed that cite HMP um, support. There are two major papers from the HMP consortium nearing completion, an HMP resource paper and an HMP analysis paper on the 300 subject healthy adult microbiome cohort study. And there's anticipated submission of these papers uh, this fall. The pilot phase of the genotype tissue expression, or GTEx project, is now out of the gates. And while initially slow, recruitment is now well underway with two dozen postmortem donors enrolled. Laboratory analysis is ongoing. And we just had the first in-person meeting of the external scientific panel this past June. And that's all I really want to say about uh, GTEx, because Jeff Struin will be making a presentation about this Common Fund project later in the open session. The next Common Fund project um, is LINCS, a library of integrated network-based cellular signatures. And in October of this, uh, in, uh, late in October, uh, the LINCS program will hold a fall consortium meeting in the DC area that will involve members of the production centers as well as newly awarded collaborative supplement technology development and computational tool awardees. Reviews were conducted this summer for U01 applicants in computational tool and advanced technology development. We expect to fund eight awards from the applicant pool based on final feedback by NHLBI and NCI September councils. And the LINCS production centers at Harvard Medical School and the Broad Institute have created public, website, public websites to inform the community about release data through its gene data browser, also to discuss current experimental components of the program and to update users on new developments in the LINCS program. For the relatively new NIH Common Fund Protein Capture Reagents Program, applications for the production and technology development components will be discussed later in the closed session of Council. And meanwhile, there will be a consortium meeting with all newly funded grantees and current members of the program in winter of 2011, um, somewhere here in the DC area. Well, this is an exciting period for, uh, for science in Africa, as featured and discussed on the cover of this recent issue of Nature. Um, and uh, there are many things uh, that are being watched and being pursued in Africa, but the NIH Common Fund's contribution to this is H3 Africa, uh, the Human Heredity and Health in Africa Project, which is an initiative to support population-based genomic studies to study diseases relevant to African people, but these studies are performed by African scientists in Africa. This is a, a joint effort with the Wellcome Trust. And as you will likely recall, NHGRI is the lead institute for NH H3 Africa, and much has happened of late in this project. And so Jane Peterson will be giving an update about H3 Africa later in the open session. Now, finally, with respect to the Common Fund, by design, recall that the Common Fund projects sunset, or at least scale back over time, allowing new Common Fund projects to be launched. So there's thus a regular process for identifying and developing possible new programs that will be supported by the Common Fund. Well, in May of this year, there was an innovation brainstorm meeting. And for this meeting, institute directors nominated very junior investigators to participate um, in this gathering, where new ideas were kicked around and um, discussions um, were held. Attendees that are familiar to NHGRI, although not all these people were nominated by NHGRI, other institutes nominated some of them, included Gonzalo Abacasis, Brad Bernstein, Manolis Kellis, and Brad Mallon. Among the topics rigorously discussed at this meeting was the possibility of a new microbiome-oriented program. In addition to somewhat broad ideas that emanated from this brainstorming meeting, 
Each institute and center was invited to submit up to two new common fund ideas for further consideration. NHGRI's two proposals were in the area of disruptive proteomic technologies, somewhat modeled after our DNA sequence technology development program. And our second one was molecular phenotype for genome function and disease, very much oriented towards a post-GWAS effort at understanding the molecular basis of disease phenotypes. And we're now in a comment period, um, um, at least until, I guess, it's till two more days. So if you haven't already and you're interested in looking at not only our proposals, but all the proposals that came in from other institutes, uh, now is the time to get your voice heard. There's an open comment period online. So I'd encourage you the next couple of days to look at it and weigh in if you are interested. So that's our involvement uh, with the Common Fund. Uh, let me briefly now move on um, and tell you about developments in the Office of the Director. Um, this is going to be a, a relatively short section because normally I would cover um, uh, areas related to the Office of, of um, uh, Policy, Communications, and Education, but this, this council meeting, uh, Laura Rodriguez is going to follow me and describe in greater detail activities of that office, which she directs. So I'll only talk about um, activities of the Office of Population Genomics in this particular case. So we will start off um, with a reminder, the Office of Population Genomics oversees the Electronic Medical Records and Genomics Network, or known as Emerge Network. This project has wrapped up its first phase, which has included efforts of five investigative sites, um, in addition to two genotyping centers and an administrative coordinating center within the Vanderbilt site. Uh, the network entered its phase two with seven awards, uh, five to phase uh, one sites, but also two to, do to, to new integrative sites and one award to a coordinating center at Vanderbilt. The goals of Emerge 2 were to demonstrate that patients' genetic information linked to disease or clinical manifestations in their electronic medical records can be used to improve their care. Um, because Emerge 2 has no pediatric sites, an RFA to solicit pediatric sites was released in July with applications due uh, tomorrow. The Office of Population Genomics continues its excellent curation of the GWAS catalog. There continues to be exponential growth in the number of publications reporting GWAS findings which means our GWAS catalog continues to grow at a, at a, a significant rate. Um, the latest complete summary goes through the end of the first quarter of this year and reflects 862 publications with 1,319 1, associations at P uh, less than or equal to 5 times 10 to the minus 8 for 221 different traits. Uh, remarkably, in it, besides the summary as of then, our catalog actually has now surpassed the 1,000th publication mark and that occurred on September 6th of this year. And the last update from the Office of Population Genomics uh, relates to the Phoenix Project, which published a paper describing the design of the Phoenix Toolkit in the August issue of the American Journal of Epidemiology. And I would also tell you that Phoenix also published a paper in the May issue of the American Journal of Preventative Medicine on adoption of standard method measures in biomedical research. Now, Phoenix has now um, teamed up with NIDA, the National Institute of Drug Abuse, for a one-year project to expand substance use measures in the toolkit for which NIDA is providing $730,000. This will involve convening three working groups of substance abuse and addiction experts who will be tasked with identifying measures that will expand the scope of the toolkit to include additional substance use and addiction, addictive me addiction measures to promote data harmonization within the NIDA and also the NIAAA grantee community. The Phoenix um, Administrative Supplement Program had, had their kickoff meeting earlier this month, and investigators are adding a variety of Phoenix measures to existing studies. Finally, the supplement program will also help us evaluate the overall usefulness of the Phoenix Toolkit. We expect this work to be completed by fall of next year. And moving to the final area, um, I wanted to say a few things um, about our, our intramural program, and actually, um, the, the first one I think is particularly relevant. I want to remind you that in general, council um, doesn't get too heavily involved in our intramural program. We have a separate board of scientific counselors, actually with Sean Eddy, currently serves on, um, um, that uh, oversees in greater detail uh, our intramural program. But there is one development that I want to make council particularly aware of um, because um, it sort of goes at a level even higher than our, our standing board of scientific counselors. So. Um, really, this is the most significant development that's taking place in our intramural program, and it relates to something called the Blue Ribbon Panel Review. Now, Blue Ribbon Panel Reviews um, of intramural programs of NIH institutes is something that was started actually by Harold Varmus when he was director of the NIH, 
And the idea was to augment the detailed reviews that take place of individual investigators every four years with a sort of a higher altitude, holistic review of an intramural program much less frequently. And in fact, by policy, um, Harold put into place that such a high level external review should be conducted of every intramural program every 10 years, once a decade. And uh, so for a variety of reasons, I actually just, I decided to, to conduct a blue ribbon panel review of our intramural program. Um, there are actually several reasons for that that I'm happy to share. Uh, first of all, it turns out that our last blue ribbon panel review of our intramural program took place in 2001. So we were due. It was 10 years and we should be doing this anyway. But it also was recognition that a lot of new leadership on board. We have a new scientific director of our intramural program, a new deputy scientific director, and, and I'm relatively new to this job, so it's a whole new leadership team at the Institute. It seemed like an appropriate time um, to get some good external advice about the program. Um, I'd also point out the new strategic plan for the Institute is obviously out, and I think the intramural program is very interested to hear wise counsel on how they are aligning to that strategic plan, how they could be enhancing certain areas, how they can play to their strengths. And, uh, and also, there's probably too many opportunities for our intramural researchers and too many things to do, and they have to make prior decisions, getting some input at a higher level, programmatic level, I thought would be very helpful. And then needless to say, just it's very hard to manage any science inside of NIH, outside of NIH during fiscally challenging times, and, uh, and, and, and the intramural program is going to have to do that like everybody else. And uh, it was very clear that getting some advice on making tough choices in the face of budgetary cuts Getting that advice now might prove to be very helpful to Dan Castor in particular in his first year now um, as scientific director. So I put into place, uh, put into motion um, conducting such a review. Um, the first thing I will tell you is that the review is handled not by the scientific director. In fact, it's handled a level up. It's handled uh, by me um, in partnership with the NIH director. At least that's how it's supposed to be. In this particular case, the NIH director's research program is in our intramural program. So he's been pushed aside. So Francis will have nothing to do with the review. He's recused himself. And instead, Michael Gottesman, who is the director of the, or is deputy director of NIH, or associate director for intramural research, he leads the Office of Intramural Research at NIH and really oversees all the intramural programs. He has stepped in. And so he and I will be jointly overseeing this review. And, um, and so I have now recruited uh, this panel. Uh, names are probably familiar to every one of you. It was required to have, a rep by, by policy, a representative from both council and by our standing board to provide that kind of institute and, uh, and intramural specific input. Uh, Rick Myers has agreed to be the council representative, and Bruce Korf has agreed to be the Board of Scientific Council's representative. And as you can see, otherwise, we just sort of got a superstar studded cast of individuals who are willing to put in their time. This is not a one shot, one kind of meeting review. It's about a nine month process. It'll involve a couple of face-to-faces and probably a couple of conference calls. It's, it's, an, it's really a very cerebral, strategic, back and forth kind of a process, we hope. Um, I would, uh, it's sort of scheduled to take place between now and uh, the beginning of next summer to provide advice for the beginning of the following fiscal year. Um, I will absolutely be, we will be bringing the report and a presentation about this review to council because I think it's high enough level that council should be aware of this. I would expect um, that will probably happen a year from now because I don't think it will be wrapped up by May Council. So my prediction is a year from now we will be updating you about this Blue Ribbon Panel review. Getting on to the science of the intramural program, let me just tell you a few recent research highlights from our intramural program. One of the most notable ones was, was the discovery of the gene mutated in Proteus syndrome. This is a rare disorder that causes tissue and bone to grow out of proportion of the body. It was a 15-year search. Um, uh, led by an NHGRI research team by, by Les Biesecker. And uh, finally, uh, using next-gen sequencing, discovered that mutations in AKT1 um, are what are responsible for Proteus syndrome, a result they reported in this um, paper in the New England Journal of Medicine. And interesting molecular insights from these findings may help establish the cause of the so-called elephant man severe disfigurement. Other recent highlights to quickly run through from our intramural program since last council meeting, Chuck Van Didi and colleagues reported a study where whole exome sequencing led to finding the gene for combined malonic and methylmalonic aciduria, increasing the likelihood of diagnosing this rare metabolic disorder. NHGRI researchers published a study reporting that mutations in the NBEAL2 gene 
um, cause the bleeding disorder known as gray platelet syndrome. Uh, in two studies led by Ken Kao, working with Francis Collins, provide new insights about hutchinson gilford progeria syndrome. One reported that cells from progeria patients responded to treatment with rapamycin, which flushes accumulation of the toxic protein progerin from the cell. And in a separate study, these researchers showed that progerin is activated in normally aging cells as telomeres get degraded. And a collaboration to generate a gene expression map of the mouse cerebral cortex between researchers involved researchers in the... We have music, don't we? Marmalee's group at NHGRI and the Ponting group at Oxford University, um, led by this uh, Grant Belgard, who's shown here, is a joint graduate student between those two labs. And that was also recently published. You know, I, I guess... Is I, there somebody on the phone who's uh, on hold? There must be something about when the music starts. It probably means... I, I need to wrap up my director's report, and the timing is perfect. So what can I say? We are at the end. Uh, before I conclude, I should once again help Chris Letterstrand thank her profoundly for helping me get this 85-slide uh, uh, PowerPoint presentation together, but also thanks to Larry Thompson, Judy White, and the web team for getting all this electronic resource. And finally, thanks to most of the staff sitting behind you and some that aren't even in the room because Chris goes out and coordinates all these activities, there's probably about 40 or 50 people that put slides together uh, for this presentation each time. So we thank all of you. This is a real group effort. So I will stop there and answer any questions you may have at this time about anything I've covered. Yep, Jeff. Um, when you were discussing uh, NCATS, um, you did mention the Cures Acceleration Network. And maybe could you just update us as to whether that concepts is still on the table and going to contribute to NCATS? Oh, yes. And uh, wow, I, I won't know this in as much detail. So anybody in the back of the room or on the side of the room who know these details better than me, um, please step to a microphone. It, so the Cures Acceleration Network will happen. It's been authorized, but not appropriated. So they actually have to put money in it. And that's actually very important because that will trigger not only money, it will actually trigger flexibilities with money that NIH normally doesn't have, DARPA-like flexibilities, and that's very important. So that requires real legislation to, to kick that in. Whether that happens as part of the anomaly with the continuing resolution, I don't know. I, 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 I actually just honestly don't know that. I mean, in the long run, we want that's going to likely happen. It's just a matter of whether that happens with the real budget or whether that happens through the anomaly. Uh, I actually don't know, and I don't know if anybody else knows here. Um, but what I do know is, at a minimum, what they want to have happen is uh, within this anomaly is just to create the organizational creation of NCADS. Because even if that happens, it allows the pieces to be moved around, such as the piece out of NHGRI to be moved under the roof of NCADS, and allows the big piece from NCRR, the CTSA program, to move in and various other things. So I think more than anything, they just need that minimum permission for the reorganization. And that can be just simply, my understanding, through an anomaly. Don't know about the, but I mean, again, care acceleration after absolutely still on the horizon. It's a matter of what part of this legislative uh, journey. And nobody's jumping up and down, which either means I got it right or nobody knows. Other questions? Okay.